Good evening. So tonight, I thought I'd talk about what we call the Abhidhamma. Abhi means high. Dhamma is, in this case, means something like reality. So the Abhidhamma are high reality, or they're often translated as ultimate reality. But the point about high is not is a bit misleading because there's an idea that it's somehow more important or more useful than the rest of the Buddha's teaching. But that's not the point of Abhi. Abhi means in a higher sense. Because the Dhamma of the Buddha encompassing all the many thousands of teachings he gave it quite often is is given in conventional language so if you look at the Satipatthana Sutta which is the Sutta we use to the discourse of the Buddha that we use to base our practice on the Buddha says gachanto va gachami dipajanati when walking one knows I am walking. Who knows, not just knows, but sees clearly, knows fully, I am walking. But he doesn't mean that one knows this is myself that is walking, or that this thing that's happening is walking, and walking is a real thing. He means that when something happens, you know it just as the thing that happened. So walking is an experience, and when walking happens, you don't know it as anything else, not good or bad or not and not and not distracted by anything else that you're with it. But in a conventional sense, he's he's the things he's talking about, uh, they're not real. They're just in a conven they're just conventional. In a higher sense. In a higher sense, the only reality is the experience of walking, the experience that we call walking, the physical and the mental realities, aspects of the experience. And so that's what's meant by Abhidhamma. It's like underneath our ordinary conception of things, what's really going on is the Abhidhamma. So this is important because our perspective on things has to change in the practice, even in the beginning of the practice. When you're just starting out, you have to learn, like with any skill or any training, you have to learn the perspective of the training. Like... Uh, a rock climber. When an ordinary person looks at a cliff, they just see rock. But when a rock climber looks at it, they see it based on their skill, based on their training. Perspective is really very important when you, even in the world, all things have uh, meaning based on their uh, the perspective. Uh, a book, a book for me is, uh, for any of us is, a source of information, but for a termite or a bookworm, it's a source of food. Their, their perception of it is completely different. And that sort of reality is involved with meditation. Someone who doesn't meditate, their perception of walking is their foot moving. But a meditator, as we train, someone who's trained, their perception of moving is an experience of tension, of heaviness, of heat and cold and hard and soft and so on, and a judgment of it and all the mental realities. The perspective is different, 
And so the Abhidhamma helps us to understand, it's like learning the tools of the trade. And more importantly, more, more powerfully, it's learning about what's really going on. Like a, a, a mechanic, a person who looks at a car, who starts the car, and it doesn't start, they take it to the mechanic, they might say, my car is making a funny noise. And the mechanic says, oh well, I know what that is, that's this and this and this. But the person, for them it was just a funny noise. And for the mechanic it's not a funny noise at all, it's a result of this and this and this, because they understand. So a meditator understands the components of the experience. The components of the reality of moving, of standing, of walking and sitting. And those components are, are, are in one very complete way of understanding them is as the, what we call the Abhidhamma. So the Abhidhamma is a set of four realities that are called the Abhidhamma. And these are said to make up everything that really and truly exists. Everything that's really and truly real. In a higher sense, right? People and places and things, in a conventional sense, they're real. Walking in a conventional sense is real. But underneath that, in an ultimate sense, there are only four things, or four categories of things. These four are called Chitta, Chedasika, Rupa, and Nibbana. So I'll explain a little bit about these just as a, I think, a useful description of the practice, of, of the things you're experiencing as your practice. Because gaining this perspective, um, gaining this sort of information, or these ideas about this this set of realities will help bring you closer to the perspective of a meditator. You'll recognize and you'll become more familiar with the experiences underlying all of your daily life when you walk and so on. Being having a clear sense of what exactly exists will allow you to see more clearly as you practice. It will, it, it will help you. This is the sort of thing that teachings are designed for, to support your practice. The ability to recognize, for example, I mean, that's a very important part of what mindfulness is. So giving you this information helps to support your ability to recognize when you repeat to yourself, pain, pain, and so on. Recognizing that oh, that's this, that's this. It's very helpful. Knowing what is real and what is not real helps to attune you to the real. So jitta, the first one is called jitta. Jitta is called is consciousness, or simply the mind. So when we think about the mind in a conventional sense, we think about my mind as a thing that exists throughout time. That's what takes an object. Uh, we talk about losing our mind. We talk about having an open mind. Our idea of mind is, is a, as a, an entity. and in, in a conventional sense, that's true, of course. I don't think other people's thoughts, so I have my mind and I have certain faculties that I can see and I can develop and that fade over time, my memories and so on. But in an in ultimate reality, since experience is only momentary, jitta or consciousness is something that arises and ceases with every experience. So when seeing a part of that experience is the consciousness of it. That's all that mind means in ultimate reality. The idea of my mind and so on is just an idea. Something that we 
get a sense of based on repetitive and patterns of based on repetitive patterns of existence, of experience experiencing the same sorts of things gives us a sense of what our mind is like the fact that we experience moment after moment and other people don't experience gives us a sense that we have a mind and so on but what you can actually experience what you can actually come in contact with is moments. And in the practice that's very important to see the, the, the difference, to have again the new way of seeing that is more clear, to understand that our conceptions of things that exist in space and time are just conceptions. Gaining this perspective allows you to, you'll, you'll feel yourself coming closer to reality, closer to this present moment, really being here in a way that you weren't here, because we're up in our heads, we're very much involved in imagining concepts, ideas. So every moment that we experience, there's a consciousness. That's what allows experience. If there were no consciousness involved, it would not be an experience. When someone else experiences something, it's because of their consciousness. There's a consciousness involved that, that, that is different from the consciousness involved in our experience. And that moment is very, very brief, but there is an awareness during that moment. In the Abhidhamma, the, the, the summary of the Abhidhamma that we, we all learn, we understand that there are 121 different kinds of consciousness. But all that means is there are 121 different sorts of ways that we can be conscious of something. In fact, our consciousness is, is simply this awareness. And so we, we have to understand from, it, it, the important thing to understand about consciousness is how it differs from conventional understanding. Like if you read the, the suttas, the Buddha said things like, ye chittang sanyame santi mokanti marabandana. When one trains the mind, one becomes, uh, one becomes free from, from mara, free from evil. So the and other things like training the mind leads happiness and so on leads to happiness. But this conventional understanding of of the mind, without any training, without undergoing the sort of training that the Buddha taught, is really a, a very big part of the problem. Because our mind. You know, allows us to judge and causes us to cling to things. You know, the idea of of me and mine and I. When we change our perspective, when we're able to see moments of consciousness arising, our whole experience, our whole reality changes. Because there is no clinging to ideas or, or clinging to self and, and so on. There are just these moments a thought arises and ceases and rather than clinging to it or getting the idea of I am having a thought or so on, this is my thought. Which of course causes us to, to cling to the thought. Is what allows us to cling to the thought when we judge things, when we like or dislike when we react to things, then we, we think about it and we, we identify with our reaction. It causes, it snowballs into problems and stress and so on. 
ultimately uh, in terms of citta, in terms of consciousness, there is only one moment after moment after moment, simply an experience of things. Why it's uh, separated out into 121 different minds is because of the second ultimate reality, the one we call Chitasika. So if citta is consciousness, citta is the, the knowing of an object, Chitasika are the ways that we know an object. Chitasika refers to our quality of knowing the quality of the awareness, the factors involved in the knowing. So if you are angry, if you if you if you like or dis if you dislike something, if you're clinging to something, if you understand something and see it clearly, or if you don't understand and you're confused or doubting about something. All of these are jitasikas. All of the characteristics of the mind. They, there are 52 of them. And when they combine together, you have wholesome minds, unwholesome minds, and then you have just functional minds. And this is what you experience in, in, in meditation That's probably the most important aspect Is the difference When you read the Abhidhamma from the very beginning The first three, three items The Buddha says Kusala Dhamma, Akusala Dhamma Abhyagata Dhamma it Means wholesome realities, unwholesome realities And neither wholesome nor unwholesome Or indeterminate Realities. And this is the real question that we're seeking when we practice meditation Is the understanding of the differences here We're not doing this practice just for an intellectual satisfaction We're doing it to understand what is kusala and what is akusala And the meaning behind these is what is causing us suffering And what is causing happiness what is beneficial and what is harmful. So each of our experiences is made up of a consciousness and each consciousness has characteristics and it's learning about those characteristics is, is what we're doing in our meditation practice. Seeing that sometimes you like something, sometimes you dislike something, those are jetasikas. Those are qualities of the consciousness. When you're sitting still and you feel pain or you feel pleasure, there are going to be qualities of consciousness that arise. When you think about something, then there's going to be qualities of consciousness that arise. These two together, arising and ceasing, make up really the most important part of our practice, the most important objects of our experience. The Buddha said of the mind, though, he said, it's something that's very hard to, very hard to catch. He once likened it to a, a, a wild animal. He said, Durangamang, it wanders far. Ekacharang, it wanders alone. It's describing a beast that wanders far and is always alone. Asarirang, but it has no body, it has no corporeal form. It's like a, a ghost or a monster. Guhasayang, and it dwells in a cave. The mind dwells in a cave, like Plato said. It doesn't actually see all of reality. It dwells in the cave of the body. So our experience of reality is inhibited by the six senses and by our 
qualities of mind, and by our habits, by our partialities and so on, our biases. And so studying the mind is very difficult. Studying reality is very difficult with our mind. Trying to chase after the mind like a wild animal is very difficult. So you, you might know that you have, generally know that we have greed, that we have anger, that we have delusion. Like that person who was asking about pride, they know they have the pride. How do they catch it like a wild animal? And so we have the third ultimate reality, and this is rupa. And of course it's there, we have to describe it anyway, but not only is it a part of reality, but it's an important part, in, especially in the sense of being easy to catch. Rupa isn't like a wild animal. It isn't wandering far. It sort of stays put. Right, your mind be, might be wandering all over the place, but you know what's always there is your your body. Rupa, rupa means the physical form. But rupa doesn't mean bodies and people and places and things. Rupa means the physical aspect of experience, and the physical aspect of experience is much easier to take as an object than the mental aspect. Because it's it lasts longer, it's more stable, generally. And so it makes a good place to, like a hunter, to wait for the wild animal. If you go to where the animal is going to go, you can catch the animal. The same way if you go to where the mind is going to go, go to the body. Focus on the body. You'll see as you do that how the mind works. Of course, because it's the mind doing the work. A part of the practice is learning about how you practice. Right? And what we call practice is just a, an experiment to try and do something and observe like as if you're taking notes and you're, you're gathering data about that, that activity. When we walk, there's not something magical about walking. We just want to see what the mind does when you walk. So we watch the walking, and we start to see what the mind does when we walk. But the ultimate reality of the physical, and this is important to make sure that we are focused in the right way, is simply the experience. So when you move the foot, there isn't actually the foot moving. Not as you experience it anyway. What do you experience? You experience tension. You experience heat, cold, hard, soft. Basically the four elements. You experience the heat and cold, which is the fire element. You experience hardness and softness, the earth element. Tension and flaccidity, the, the air element. You don't experience the water element, but apparently it's there. It's a part of things, the cohesion element. And based on this we have, based on these experiences, we have the, uh, the six senses, because of course the uh, tension in the ear gives us a new sense. And uh, the heat and whatever you could call it that touches the nose and the eye, this creates a different type of consciousness. And then you have space. Well, based on that, you gain this conception of space. But it's not just a conception. It appears that based on matter, some of it is, is you know, you have to move to touch it. There has to be, so there's a sense of space. But space is not really real. A space is just a function of matter. You don't experience space. You experience the activity of moving from one direction to an, one position to another. But it's always experiencing and it's always in this without location. And so our 
our observation of, of matter forms really the basis of our practice. When you focus on it, you start to see reality in a new way. Your way of observing is based on experiences. You see them arising and ceasing. This is very, I mean, it's, it's very powerful, even though it might sound quite mundane. We don't realize how much of our, well, that all of our suffering is based very much on our conceptions. It's based on our imprecise observation of reality, our reliance on conventions. We develop conventions of people and places and things, and then we attribute characteristics to them. This person is a friend, this person is an enemy. We remember things that happened when we attribute those things to that person, right? You felt pain and you attribute it to that person as the cause. So a thing that doesn't even exist, that person, you start giving it qualities. When in fact the reality was just an experience of pain. That's gone. And so the difference is quite acute. When you cling to things as me, as mine, as good, as bad, you you build up your sense of the entities that inhabit your reality. When you focus just on experience, there are no such entities. Because there are no such entities and because you're in tune with things that are actually happening, there can be no misunderstanding. And no extrapolation, any room for hatred or any room for judgment, any room for liking or disliking is gone. You don't attribute qualities to things because you see them just as they are. You see that likability and whatever the opposite is, they don't they aren't inherent in things in reality. It's a descript this a description of how how you why it, why meditation works and mindfulness works the way it does. Because as you practice your perception is is simple. Your perception is clear. Your perception is is based on reality. So these three realities make up the, the totality of our practice. The mind is our, our experiences. The qualities of mind are really what we're working on. It's what we mean by training the mind. We want to cultivate good qualities. And our object generally is rupa. This is why we focus on the stomach, right? This, the tension in the stomach, that's rupa. Starts to ha give you this perspective of being with experience. Here's an experience, can I be with it? Learning to be with it gives you the capacity to be present. Teaches you the capacity, trains you in this capacity. And the fourth ultimate reality makes up the goal of our practice. It's given a separate category because it involves the freedom from experience. Now, experience is something that we have no shortage of, something that we're never lacking. But the freedom from experience, the freedom from arising things, the freedom from this incessant, inescapable sort of prison of arising. And by prison I mean you can't escape it. You can't say, okay, let, let there be no seeing, let there be no hearing, let there be no smelling, tasting, feeling, or thinking. Let there be none of these things. The best we can do is we sleep a lot, and if you sleep, you you don't experience much. 
But they're still arising, of course, even in sleep. There's still mental activity, and there's still physical experiences to a limited degree. But freedom from experience means this release, where the mind starts to understand that happiness doesn't come from experience. There's no thing in the world that can make us happy because things don't exist. The experiences that do exist come and go, there's nothing special about them. And our happiness cannot be dependent on those experiences. If it is, we're just going to inevitably suffer, get caught up in samsara forever. And as you see this, this isn't a theory or anything, as you, you, see, you actually see this. You start to let go. The tightness, the clinging, the, the grasping at things uh, is reduced. It eases. You start to look at things more as, as just objects of arising than, than potential. Oh, this might make me happy, that might make me happy. You see them just arising and ceasing, which is very, very real. I mean, it's, it's, it's a state of mind that is in tune with reality. Because saying that something is good or bad is, is totally no basis in the experience. It's completely your judgment. Experiencing things just as arising and ceasing, on the other hand, is very much in tune with reality. And so it's very peaceful and very pure. And when you start to see this and understand this, you realize that the happiness, there's no happiness in clinging. And your clinging ceases. And when your clinging ceases, of course, there's a, an experience of cessation. And this experience of cessation is called Nibbana. Now, Nibbana is of six kinds. Or not six kinds. There is a, it's called the sixfold nibbana, but there's only really one nibbana, and it just means freedom. It's where you have freedom from arising, freedom from suffering, freedom from the incessant continuity of experience. And then it's of two kinds, um, because it frees you from suffering. It, it frees you from defilement frees you from the causes of suffering, frees you from clinging and craving. When a person has this experience of cessation, it changes them. Their attachment, their grasp on things is reduced. And reduced and reduced until the point that they, as they experience cessation again and again, they, they eventually have no more clinging left. And this is called a sort of a freedom from suffering. But they still experience. So, so we, there are two kinds of freedom from suffering. One is the cessation, where there is no experience, no arising. And the other is the continuity of life, where a person who has experienced that goes on in their life they go on in their life but, but they still experience suffering they still experience the objects that would cause them suffering the objects that are unsatisfying it just means they experience life and they can be very happy but they can be very happy because they're not clinging they have no more clinging even though they experience great pain and old age and sickness and eventually death they don't really suffer, even though they experience dukkha, they experience what the cause of suffering. They experience the things in, in the world that we might call dukkha or unsatisfying. Because they don't cling to happy things, they don't cling to unhappy things, and, and so they're free. And the other kind of nibbana is after the, such a person. So the, the other kind is, is the cessation, and after they pass away, the, the complete cessation. But putting those aside, the more the, the important for our practice 
throughout the practice is understanding what it is that leads and this is the threefold type of nibbana what leads to nibbana so nibbana is thought to have the, this freedom is thought to have three characteristics one is called sunyata the other is called uh, sorry the first one animita the second one apanihita Apanihita, and the third one, sunyata. Animita means free from sign, free from signal. Apanihita means free from desire. And sunyata means empty. So it's said that nibbana has these characteristics, but the way to attain nibbana is also based on those three characteristics. It's a gaining an understanding of signlessness, an understanding of desirelessness, and an understanding of emptiness. So I'll explain these a little bit. Animita refers to the experience of impermanence. Signlessness means things have have a um, but things that arise arise without sign. When you experience something new, often you're quite taken off guard, surprised by it. But eventually you come to realize that there is no preceding sign to any experience. That's that's what is meant by animita. Animita means impermanence, uncertainty. You don't know in advance of anything. It's a quality, it's a part of reality that creates great danger for those who cling. And it's a part of the problem in clinging. Because of the unpredictability of things. Because there's no warning And we, we are taken off guard Because of our expectations For a person who wants and needs and expects They're going to be taken off guard when things change Because there's no warning And so seeing this That's in a conventional sense But seeing this moment to moment in our experience There's a realization of animita And you seek out what is uh, truly free from, you could say, free from the need for a sign or a warning. You seek out something that is stable. It's free from impermanence. Apanihita means desirelessness. It comes from lack of desire. When you see that nothing's worth desiring because the things that are real are just moments of experience. It's not that you throw away happiness, you just realize that happiness doesn't come from anything. Happiness is not a reality that comes from other things. It comes from, from external factors or, or any factors. It's not something that can be dependent on factors. And sunyata means empty of any kind of self. So it refers to non-self. The second one, suffering. So we have impermanent suffering and non-self. Seeing non-self is sunyata. And so sunyata means that our experiences are not, again, entities. They're not things that you can cling to, things that you can depend upon, things that you can control. They're not things. They're moments. There is a physical and a mental aspect, and that's all there is. These three are the three qualities that, the three qualities of, of wisdom, that allow us to become free from suffering. And and it may seem somewhat theoretical, but actually, it, it meditators can describe quite clearly these three, you might say, paths to nibbana, doorways, gateways. It's called the triple gateway to liberation. 
when you watch the stomach, you'll start to see sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. And a meditator can describe how they experience cessation based on that. They just find that finally their mind gave up by seeing that suddenly the mind, suddenly the rising and falling going very fast, and that was it. Suddenly they, they you know, finally they they let go. Sometimes it's very stressful and very tense and uncomfortable. So their meditator will be watching the rising, falling, and suddenly it becomes uncomfortable and unpleasant, and they just let go because of that. They see the sign of desirelessness, the not worth not worth desiring. In reality, meaning realities are not desire itself is not worthwhile because things are unsatisfying. And sometimes the stomach, watch the stomach rising, falling, and it, sometimes it appears to go by itself. And this perception, it's a dissociation from the idea of I'm controlling this, the breath. The, it's not like they create these things, but they just watch and it, it appears to them that way. And when it appears to them that way, then there's the cessation. So this is the, the qualities of the path that we cultivate. So these four are the Abhidhamma. You may have heard of the Abhidhamma and thought of it as something very theoretical. I think if you study it in the right way, you can see that it's very useful in terms of helping us understand our, our, our practice, helping us understand what it is that we're looking at. You study all the kinds of unwholesome and wholesome realities. It just just knowing that reality is made up of physical and mental, it's not made up of people and places and things. Helps you helps you acclimatize to what you actually will experience in the practice, which is the moments of this foot moving and then it's gone. And then this foot moving and that experience is gone and Becoming very much in tune with what's really going on behind our perceptions of people and places and things, entities. So I hope that was useful. Thank you all for listening. Have a good night.